No. Hello everyone, it's Michaela here and I gotta say there's a lot happening with the climate right now. In case anyone has not heard, uh, Texas is really, really going through it. Record low temperatures have forced Texas into a state of emergency. Power grids are down, power supplies are out, heat is down, water pipes are bursting, there are food shortages. It's, it's actively a terrible situation. Furthermore, because Texas's electrical grid is cut off from the rest of the country, there is no way to get emergency electricity from other states into Texas, which means that there is literally no way to get the power on until the actual electrical grid in Texas is fixed. I wanna take this opportunity not only to raise awareness for that issue and potentially give you resources to help, but talk about the science behind what's happening over there. I was going to use this time and this video to talk about my robot arm. I built a freaking robot arm. I named him Quentin and he's amazing. But I think that the climate's a little bit more important. Stop. I think the climate is a little bit more important. And because of that, we are not going to talk about Quentin today. We are going to talk about cold snaps and the climate and how all of this happened and how we can fix it for next time. Okay. First things first, what is a cold snap? Well, let's use some visual aids. I have a little clementine here, but I need two hands. So Quentin, if you could, if you could do me a solid here and uh, just take that. You could just grab this and just like set that right here. Uh, if you could just move that a little bit closer to the audience. Okay, so we have an orange and pretend this orange is the earth, okay? We have the poles on the top and bottom that are filled with cold air because they're furthest away from the equator, okay? We all know this. This cold air is separated by the rest of the equatorial air regions by what's called a jet stream. This jet stream is a circulating current of air that keeps the very cold Arctic air relatively contained uh, and separates that from the more warm air currents that are around the equatorial region. However, every so often, there are certain parts of the jet stream that wobble. And when this jet stream wobbles, this cold air in the Arctic region spills outside and runs into the mid-Atlantic regions of the globe. It's not that the air where they are is colder. It's that the cold air from the poles are being shot and guided towards these regions. And as strong as the sun is, it's just not strong enough to warm up air from here as it moves down to the equator in that short of a time. This quote unquote wobbly jet stream is the reason for these very sudden cold snaps in regions that are otherwise very warm. Remember, temperature is not just sun heats up air and air gets cold or warm. The weather is very much dependent on how that air and that heat get transported across the country and across the world. And if the jet streams that are responsible for carrying that weather fail or carry it to somewhere different, we can rely on very, very unexpected and extreme weather events all across the world. Now, the next question is how much of a role does climate change play into all of this? All you have to do is Google jet stream, climate change, cold. Those three words, and you'll probably, based on your search history, get a huge number of articles that are talking about how climate change is disrupting the jet stream. The working theory for this jet stream theory is that as the air gets warmer in the Arctic, the jet stream is getting destabilized. The lines between the warm and the cold air are getting blurred from the equator to the Arctic as those lines get blurred and as the polar vortex that's keeping that cold air contained in the poles weaken, we see more wobbling in the jet stream. We see more air being forced out from the jet stream. We see more Arctic air coming into the Northern Hemisphere. This gives the illusion that although the globe on average is getting warmer, we see places seem to be getting colder. It's not that 
global warming isn't happening or climate change is not real. It's that as our climate changes and as our jet stream evolves, it's going to be disrupting the cold air from here and blasting it to unexpected parts of the world that it usually never touches. However, our knowledge of the jet stream is not that cut and dry. Although there are a large number of page, pa blah, blah. Although there are a large number of papers that have studied this in the context of lower ice content in the poles, we still are not quite clear what a warmer Arctic means for global weather patterns. The things we do know are that the Arctic is warming almost two to three times faster than the rest of the world. Furthermore, as this jet stream gets more and more wobbly, the rotation of the polar vortex, which is the top of the globe, slows down. This means that the strength of the prevailing winds from east to west gets slower and cold snaps might last longer and longer. However, it's important to note that although direct observation and computer simulations have shown that there is a very strong likelihood that the warming of the Arctic can result in a bigger frequency and duration of cold snaps, we don't exactly know how yet. Varying computer models are showing varying effectiveness and severity with these simulated changes in the Arctic, and there are a lot more factors at play. Stratospheric temperature conditions, the tropical uh, air regions, all of these things, the Atlantic, temperature plays a huge role in determining how our weather works. However, that's not to say that we just shouldn't worry about warming up the Arctic because we don't quite exactly know how the jet stream is going to be destabilized. This phenomenon is a little bit like walking up to a sleeping tiger and slapping it in the face. Yeah, we might not be sure whether the tiger is going to bite off our arm, maul us to death, get bored and walk away, or claw us in the chest, but it's probably not a good idea to find out. And that's, a, that's an argument that you hear a lot of people that are against climate change and sustainable living sort of take. And it's the fact that we don't quite know the whole story, therefore we should not take any action to try to mitigate risk. The truth is we know quite a lot and we have a lot of hunches about what's going to happen. We just don't know exactly how bad it's going to get and we would prefer to not find out given that, you know, we kind of want the world to keep going as it is. Now let's go back to Texas because their infrastructure has been completely decimated by the cold. Their buildings are not equipped to handle the cold. Their electricity grid is not designed to work in cold temperatures. And people have been without power and heat in below freezing temperatures for days now. And Governor Abbott decided to go on to Fox News and give kind of a strange conclusion and update to this entire crisis. And one of the reasons I wanted to make this video is that there's a very strong incentive for right-leaning governors, such as Governor Abbott, that are strongly lobbied by oil industries to sort of scarecrow this entire problem onto renewable energy. There is a clip of him circulating around the internet of Governor Abbott on Fox News talking about renewable energy in response to a prompt about the effectiveness and sustainability of renewable energy in fluctuating climates. He had this to say. He says, and I quote, so this shows how the Green New Deal would be a deadly deal of the United States of America. Texas is blessed with multiple sources of energy, such as natural gas and oil and nuclear, as well as solar and wind. But you saw that our wind got shut down. And since it was more than 10% of the power grid, Texas was lacking power on a statewide basis. He then goes on to say that fossil fuel is necessary in Texas as well as other states to keep our houses warm. This was accompanied by relatively alarmist headlines such as the uh, Green New Deal catastrophe, the Green Climate catastrophe, uh, essentially saying that because the wind turbines got frozen over, they are too unstable and renewable energy is too unstable to be used in a ubiquitous uh, context across the entire country. As a scientist, I got a little bit, little bit angry, a little bit horrifyingly, terrifyingly livid because that could not be further from the truth. Now, it's very traditional for scientists to stay in the lab and keep doing science, you know? Don't get involved in politics. Don't get involved in the world. Just stay in your lab, build your robots. And uh, that's 
your existence as a scientist. However, anyone that's even studied a little bit of history understands that science is very intimately tied to politics in a lot of ways. And if scientists don't reach out and stand up to communicate true science to the public, politicians are going to try to use science in a way that is going to be damaging to the public. This statement by Abbott is one of those times. If we review his argument, he states that because the wind turbines froze over, that means they lost 10% of their energy output capacity. Because they lost 10% of their energy output capacity from the renewable sources, renewable sources are too dangerous or too unstable to be used long-term in a sustainable way and they should keep relying on oil. And there are a few key points to this argument that make it more propaganda than actual science. The first is that the reason the wind turbines got frozen over was because the wind turbines that Texas purchased were not treated for cold weather. This does not mean that wind turbines are unable to be operated in the cold. Massachusetts has a lot of its energy grid pulling from renewable sources. Temperatures get much colder here, and there's a lot more snow here than there is usually in Texas. The reason that the wind turbines froze over were because the wind turbines they purchased were not treated and protected from the cold. This argument is a bit like buying a car that has no airbags. And then when somebody gets hurt, when they get into an accident, say that all cars are intrinsically dangerous and we should go back to horse and carriages. Similar to the way airplanes can withstand very cold temperatures and keep their turbines running, you can create and manufacture wind turbines that are impervious to cold weather. If you need help on that, ask literally any of the Northern states or Canada or Antarctica. So you might be asking yourself, well, that seems really reasonable and logical. Why would the governor go on national television and talk to half the country about how renewable energy is bad because they bought shoddy wind turbines? Well, let's look at the money, shall we? The Western Values Project, uh, which is focused on public lands conservation and accountability, has tallied that the oil and gas industry has given a total of over $1,200,000 in donations to Governor Greg Abbott of Texas. When you understand that Governor Abbott has gotten over a million dollars in donations from Texas, you start to see his pitches on news outlets less as a reasonable scientific understanding of the situation and more as a advertising speech for his sponsors. This is why we can take a breaking wind turbine and instead of the solution being buy better wind turbines, they decide to make the solution do away with clean energy altogether and protect big oil. And the worst part is that because traditional news outlets do not show the funding and they do not show the intricacies of the lobbying to their viewers, many people are watching with a false sense of understanding of the climate crisis, of climate science, and of the role renewable energy plays in our society. The fact of the matter is renewable energy is extremely stable, and when built around the correct temperature resistant infrastructure, it can be an extremely good source of renewable energy, oftentimes in situations when they can't get it any other way. This, combined with the fact that Texas has separated its power grid to keep other companies and federal regulations from getting in the way, uh, combined with the fact that none of those are rated for the cold, show that not only is it imperative that we get legislation and politicians that understand and respect climate change, but we need to force them to make our cities more resilient to the impending climate crises that are bound to happen. This is why it's so important to communicate the science of this phenomenon to others. And that is where you come in. Isn't that right, Quentin? Yeah. Yeah, Quentin says yes. The first thing you can do to help is to spread safety tips and awareness to people in Texas and elsewhere via social media. Certain tips like do not leave your car running in the garage with the garage door closed to stay warm because then you can get carbon monoxide poisoning from the car's exhaust. Places like where to get blankets, where to find food, and where to donate to to try to assist some people struggling are really great ways to help and I'm going to link some of those in the description box below. The second thing you can do is to get educated on climate science in a non-alarmist way. It's really hard to not feel overwhelmed by climate change. And there's a lot of news media outlets 
all over the political spectrum that paint a very bleak picture of what's going to happen. But if you paint too bleak a picture, you're going to paralyze yourself with fear. And so I urge everyone who wants to learn more about climate change to read some of the primary sources. Go on Google Scholar, search climate change, try to fight through some of the jargon. It's really boring, but I promise you it gets easier over time. My organization, stateoftheclimate.com, does provide resources uh, for learning about climate change. I'll also put that in the description box below if you want to help. And the last thing that you can do to help, and probably the most important thing, is to share this video and share this conversation. Governor Abbott's airtime on Fox News was aired to millions and millions of people. There's going to be a lot of people that don't understand the science of climate change, that don't understand why Governor Abbott is talking the way that he is, and that don't know where his funding is coming from, that are going to believe what he says. It's so important to have these conversations because the weather events and climate changes that are going to happen in the coming decades need to be understood so we can protect as many people as we can. We need to understand who is being bought out by big oil and who is not, and we need to make sure that we're listening and empowering leaders, public figures, and scientists that are operating out of a genuine search for truth and not to follow donations or the almighty dollar. And as scientists, we need to be held more accountable to communicating these types of issues to the public. Because if we don't do our due diligence and make sure that the public understands what is true and what is false, we are going to continue to scream against the void and fight against lobbyists and multi-million dollar media corporations that have a much wider reach than us. And the only way we can make even a marginal difference is together. So share this video to someone who might not understand a lot about climate change. Talk to your parents that might think that it's all a complete hoax and silly. It might not work. In fact, it probably won't. There's going to be a lot of cognitive dissonance between people that watch Fox News and if they turn around and watch this video, they've probably already clicked off because it clashes with what they have been spoon fed for most of their life. However, we need to start having this conversation and try to get them to understand that this isn't something that is meant to hurt them, it is simply trying to help everyone. So I hope you learned a little bit about climate change today. I hope that you come out of this with a more thorough understanding of what's happening. I hope you spread this and understand how to help. And for everybody in Texas, please stay safe, stay warm, ask for help, start those fundraisers. We'll try to do our best to help and we need to be better and make sure that this is minimized. This means making sure that our politicians update our cities, keep our infrastructure robust, and ensure that when these other events do happen, we can get help. Thank you so much for watching, and hopefully I will be back in a couple weeks with more robot videos and fun science experiments. I know y'all wanna see how I made this little guy. He's adorable. So uh, get ready for that. Like, comment, subscribe if you enjoyed this video and want to see future videos. And if you have any other topics you want me to explore, definitely leave them in the comments below. Thank you so much, and I'll talk to you later.